Good morning, church. Happy Father's Day to all you dads, all those dads, or if you've been a dad in somebody's life, giving thanks this morning because our good father is our perfect example. I want to share from Proverbs a couple of verses from chapter 4, Proverbs 4. Listen, my sons, and I'm adding daughters, to a father's instruction. Pay attention and gain understanding. I give you sound learning. So do not forsake my teaching, for I too was a son to my father, still tender and cherished by my mother. Then he taught me and he said to me, take hold of my words with all your heart, keep my commands and you will live. You know, Dad, sometimes we try to impart wisdom to, to our kids. Sometimes it comes off really clunky, doesn't it? Sometimes even we, we are, make a joke of, of how we impart that wisdom to our kids. This morning we're going to watch a real short video done by the skit guys. And it starts out with this competition between the two dads of the wisdom and the jokes that they play on one another. But soon it gets to that point where it gets down to the heart of the matter. Gene. Yeah, isn't that true? Talk to your kids or someone else will. Yeah, Karen. So these are things that dads say to their sons and daughters. Yep, these are things that dads say to their sons and daughters. And, and, uh, and, and you'll get it as, as soon as it starts. But it's this little competition, but it does get to the heart of the matter. Pastor? Yeah. Who's... Could I just add one thing? Sure. Right. Absolutely. My son is now 56 years old. Hey, we never, the, the older we get sometimes, the stronger those words of wisdom are and those words of grace, truth, and life. Welcome to another dad. Now, is anybody, and I mean anybody at all, willing to face our champion? Nope. <laughs> Gentlemen, my son joined the golf team at school. So, bought him an extra pair of socks in case he gets a hole in one. said a good Christian dad would buy her a car. So I said, well, a good Christian kid would walk. Because that's what Jesus did. Fathers! We have a dad off. Son, just because God picked your nose doesn't mean you should. <laughs> when you start paying the bills, you can make some of the rules. Come on! Yeah. Yeah. Hold up! Who touched the thermostat? Yeah. Yeah. That lawn isn't gonna mow itself. Let me stop what I'm doing and fix your board. Hi, hungry. I'm dad. <laughs> I love the smell of Home Depot in the morning. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Just wait till your mother gets home. Yeah. Yeah. 
Pull my finger. Nah. Just rub some dirt on it. You can do hard things. I love you, no matter what. When God made you, he made something very special. The proudest day of my life is the day you made me a father. I thank God for you every time I get on my knees and pray. And again. Who gives this woman? No. No, no you look at me. You look at me. Who gives this woman to, to be married to this man? Her mother and I do. in our time of worship. Let us stand as we enter into worship.
join me in sharing the word? Friends, have you benefited in any way from being a Christian follower? Does being united with God's Spirit give you reason to rejoice? This amazing love joins us together in one mind, heart, and voice. Let's pray. With joy and thanksgiving, we come to worship the living God. Now let us pray. Jesus, we look to thee. Let it us in thy name agree. Show thyself the Prince of Peace. Bid our strife forever cease. By the reconciling love, ever stumbling block remove. Each to each united in dear, come and spread thy banner here. Amen. Now will you join me in hymn number 554. Now will you join me in the Apostles' Creed? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he arose from the dead. He ascended to heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Today's scripture is 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 20 through 27. 
if they were all one, okay, as it is, there are many parts but one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I do not need you, and the hand cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, these parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable, and the parts that we think are less honorable we treat with special honor, and the parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty. While our presentable parts need no special treatment, but God has combined the members of the body and has given greater honor to the parts that lacked it, so that there should be no division in the body, but that each part should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices. Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is part of it. And the second scripture is from Mark 12, 29 through 31. Jesus said, I will ask you one question. Answer me and I will tell you what authority I'm doing these things. Oh, wait, I'm sorry. Yeah. Oh, 12. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. The most important one, answered Jesus, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might and with all your strength. The second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no greater commandment than this. Can everybody say amen? amen. Thank you, Kay. I invite you to bow your heads in prayer with me. Glorious and awesome God, may the words of my mouth May the meditation of all of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, some of you are probably happy to hear we're now at number six and habit number seven of the seven habits of highly effective people by Stephen Covey, which I am adapting to our Christian walk. Habit one was be proactive. Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through him who gives me strength. Habit two, begin with the end in mind. Philippians 1.6, he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Habit three, put first things first. Matthew 6.33, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Habit four, think win-win. Romans 12, 16 tells us to live in harmony with one another. Habit five, seek first to understand, then to be understood. James 1, 19, everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. And here we are at habit six, synergy. Covey says that synergy is the habit of creative cooperation. It is to do with, has to do with teamwork, with open-mindedness, and the adventure of finding new solutions to old problems. But cooperation doesn't just happen on its own. We know that. It's a process. Through, and through this process, people bring uh, all their personal experience. We, we bring our expertise we bring those things to the table and we collaborate and we uh, work on solutions together. There's a saying attributed to St. Augustine. Karen, will you read that nice and loud for us? And many Christian leaders throughout the years have applied this to their teachings. 
Um, synergy with others means that in order to come to solutions where both parties win, where there is a mutual benefit, we need to work together. The idea is to cooperate to find new solutions to old problems as we work through these things together. In necessary things, meaning those big things which define who we are, together we need unity. The church needs to be unified around Christ and his teachings and his salvation and plan for our lives. In things where personal preferences are all that's on the line, then certainly we need to be willing to tolerate variations, person's preferences. Like, I might like Skippy peanut butter, and you might like Jif. And in all situations, whether immutable truths or simple personal preferences, we are to treat one another with love and respect. Even if you're a King James Version and I'm an NIV, we need to respect each other. Ecclesiastes chapter 4. Kyle, would you read that for me? Spoken by a guy who recently um, celebrated an anniversary, so this is a perfect verse for that, right? <laughs> You've heard it said that two heads are better than one because they have a good return on their labor, as Ecclesiastes tells us. The whole is greater than the sum of the parts. That's the idea behind synergy. When two entities bring their unique gifts to the table, together they're able to produce something that is much better than either of them can do on their own. Teamwork. If I could for a moment, I'm going to uh, relate how I see synergy to Karen and I, uh, our relationship. You've, seen, you've heard me say that Karen and I are partners in life and ministry. We came to you uh, many years ago in Christ as a married, unified team. We continue in that. Uh, our life journey is one that we believe is directed by God, and so we're trusting in him as we continue on. We are united in our love for Christ, first and foremost. We step into the next page of our story as a team just as we came to you, united in Christ. We continue, like many of you, in fear and trembling as we approach these next stages in our dependence on God and the good fruit that we believe he wants to continue to produce. We started our lives as imperfect people. Say amen. Yep. Yep. Different in many ways, each of us having our own strong points and our own weak points, our insecurities, weaknesses. Totally different people. I'll, I'll let you guess. One of us is an introvert. One of us is an extrovert. <laughs> one of us is very musical. One of us is not so much. One of us is a details person, and one of us is more of a big picture person. One is a word person, and another of us are more hands-on. Both uh, confident in some things and extremely, extremely insecure in other things. Oh, yeah. One of us is petite and one of us isn't. <laughs> We're two, two totally imperfect, totally different people united in love by that one perfect, totally perfect God. And as such, we become useful to him as we surrender ourselves. It's true with us. It's true with you and your relationships with one another and relationship with God. The kingdom of God is like, we say that a lot, don't we? Because the scriptures, uh, Jesus talks about the kingdom of God is like this. 
So I'm going to use the analogy of epoxy. When you buy a uh, tube at the hardware, it's often in two separate syringes. And to get the most benefit, what do you have to do? Let's go say it out loud. Mix, mix it together, right? You have to mix these two components together in equal measure. And either part of the mix left on its own, it's just a gloppy mess. But once the two are mixed and applied, the chemical reaction happens and it hardens and it bonds and it results in this super strong joint. One thing that's often difficult for people with dissimilar gifts and graces, which we all have, dissimilar gifts and graces, is valuing the other's differences. Too often we, we don't want to even acknowledge what benefits another person brings to the table. But open cooperation can gain us new insight in our relationships, uh, contributing to results, solutions that are much better than the ones we would have had by ourselves. This passage from Ephesians chapter 4, I'll go to this side. Ranju, would you read that out loud for us? Thank you. God desires for us to attain to the full measure of the fullness of Christ as we work together as a body, a body in him. I want to uh, say that unity is not sameness. It means oneness of purpose. As a team and I, you know, we've tried to lead by example, um, not asking people to do things we weren't willing to do, um, sometimes probably not requiring things that we should have and, and for that. So this Sunday is also our apology if we failed you in some way in these 18 years um, in helping you to mature and grow into the fullness of Christ. But unity is not same is not sameness. While we're talking about synergy, this creative um, unity and cooperation, I, I have to remind you not to mistake unity for uniformity for unities, sameness for oneness. Unity means that we agree together, even though we are not the same, we agree together so that the will of Christ is manifest in each individual because each part is important. We are many parts different and yet united. Unity is an outward focus and has an object of our oneness, which for us is Christ. For us, the body, the church, is Christ. Uniformity, on the other hand, would claim that we, we should all be the same or, or that we should all be a hand or that we should all be a foot. Uniformity promotes sameness, not oneness does not promote unity. Unity sees our differences as a strength, combining for the fullness of Christ and his body. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, do not think of uh, yourself more highly than you ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function. So we, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members one of another, having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us. Let us use them. It says if prophecy, if your gift is prophecy, use it in proportion to your faith. That if, if it is service, then use it in serving the one who teaches, someone who teaches, and his teaching, the one who exhorts, should be exhorting. The one who contributes should be contributing. You get the picture, right? 
the one who is generous, let them exercise that gift. The one who leads, lead with zeal. The one who does acts of mercy, do it with cheerfulness. Do you see yourself in any of those character traits, those, those gifts of God's Spirit? The goal of synergy is oneness, not sameness. If your gift is serving, serve. If it's teaching, teach. If it's encouragement, encourage. And the gifts go on. Melding with the other gifts to make a more perfect union. Not sameness, but unity and oneness in, in the, this miraculous body of Christ. So synergy is the essence of principle-centered leadership. It's a catalyst that brings together dissimilar parts and unifies them to unleash amazing productivity. The creative cooperation nurtured by synergy benefits the whole body. It benefits you and it benefits me as a part of that body. The promotion of synergy is a move away from our, our guarded, our adversarial, selfish, insecure, judgmental, inward. Habit seven, the final of the seven. Sharpen the saw. Let's see. Who would like to read over here? Yeah, Sarah, please. Very good. Thank you much. And that, that one is from Colossians 2. It's not on the screen, but it's from Colossians 2. Sharpening the saw is a process of, of preserving and enhancing our greatest asset through self-renewal. And we're going to learn our lesson about this from the chainsaw. Some of you have used chainsaws. Nothing is like the feel of a sharpened chainsaw blade when you're cutting into wood, right? Any amens? Whoops. Get back here. Here we go. Uh, recently, we cut down a tree in the back of the parsonage, this big old maple tree that was getting hollow in the center. And uh, we had Skeeter and Jamie Pete there on the left picture. You can see this cloud of chips. They ha they're starting with a, uh, right, with a sharpened blade, chain, a sharpened chain. And that is just spewing out chips like crazy. And of course, I didn't want to leave out the part where the tree is falling. But here were some guys who were helping out that morning. And Gene, he's up on the tractor there. And Mark McNeely, he, he's pushing the trailer around. He's a strong guy. He's pushing the trailer around. And John Bean, you can see him uh, working on splitting those uh, big, and, and that was a pretty good-sized trunk. And, and uh, these guys worked together, but the idea being that there is, uh, needs to be sharp, sharpening the blade. But you also experience those times when when you cut through a log and you hit the dirt, or you cut into a log and, uh, and the chain hits a nail in the tree. Uh, Joyce was talking the other day about not wanting to cut this tree down behind their house because the kids all built uh, tree houses in there and, it and left many nails. What happens when you hit a nail or you, you dull your blade? How efficient are you? Zero, Zero right? You can put all of your effort into that thing, and you can push, and you can, uh, but until you take, stop, and sharpen that blade, you're going to not be very productive. And you're not going to be very satisfied either. And you're going to be worn out. So you keep up with the futile effort if you haven't sharpened your blade. And uh, the principle of habit seven is to sharpen your saw. If you want to accomplish your goal and continue to make wood, you have to stop and sharpen your tools. We all know there are many philosophies of life, and almost all of them deal with four central core 
things of the human, of each one of us. Areas that are fundamental in our relation to self-care. So sharpening the saw means to shut self-care. Uh, these are physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual things. Being the best of who we can be requires taking care of yourself. If we get dull in any of these areas, we need to take the time to stop and sharpen. Mark 12, our verse today, talked about hearing, uh, hearing, O Israel, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. These same four primary areas of the whole person can be correlated in our love for God, I believe. The heart correlates to the emotions, to our emotions. The soul correlates to our spiritual being. Mind is our mental Strength is obviously physical. All four areas need to be nurtured so that the child of God can be his or her very best. That's the greatest commandment, to love God with all that we are. Then Jesus tells us, in addition to that, to love our neighbor, to love one another. Ephesians 5 29 says, After all, no one ever hated their own body, but they fed and cared for their body, just as Christ does the church. For we are members of his body. Self-care makes us more available to Christ and his church than his kingdom-building efforts. Love your neighbor as yourself. I used to think that when I thought about that, I'm supposed to love myself, doesn't that sound like narcissism? I think that's a definition of it. And contrary to the will of God, but loving oneself actually means to take care of that person that God made you to be. The whole person so that you can uh, more fully bear his image. This is not narcissism because the goal is not our self-glorification. It's God-glorification. It's perfectly legitimate to value and care for God's most special creation, and that's you. Because you are his creation. You are important to him. And as your creator, he wants his best for you. That means he loves you. The Father's Day message today isn't just for our kids. It's for you from the Father. That he loves you. Loves you beyond measure. We don't stop there. He wants you to exhibit his, exhibit his best to others. You exist. Each one of us have a purpose. We exist for the glory of God and his ministry to others in extension. God wants you to love and care for yourself. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. All gets back to self-care. I remember uh, years ago, the Biggest Loser TV show used to give examples after example of people who had a low view of themselves that manifest in uh, poor behavior and decisions. And we can take any uh, kind of addictive behavior, and at the core you find a person who, who doesn't love themselves. It really is the core that we do not love ourselves the way God intends us to. We need the influence of God to help correct our wayward thinking. We all have disordered thinking in some way, shape, or form. And we need to center ourselves again on God and his love for us. Whether it be true narcissistic uh, love for self or a hatred of self, the best we can do is first accept God's unconditional love for us and love him in return and to embrace a love for self that is in line with God's love for us. To get reset, to reset ourselves on being centered on Christ. So balance self-care in the four areas is a matter of sharpening the saw. And it looks like this. In the physical, as we said, strength, exercise, nutrition, stress management. Our society is full of all sorts of health-related problems, right? Uh, because in large uh, cases, uh, we didn't care well for our bodies. 
So when we neglect God's structure in our lives, uh, things just get worse. And this is a reminder, too, this morning, to, to don't think you don't have time to take care of yourself because in reality, you don't have time uh, not to sharpen your saw. And this is rem reminds me of a, of a quote that Martin Luther made. I have so much to do that I shall spend the first three hours of my day in prayer. That's how he approached the day. He said, I've got so many things to do, I cannot but spend my first three hours in prayer. Wow. That's a standard, isn't it? Emotional or social, the heart. How do we see ourselves? What is our self-image? It gets back to the need to love God and then love ourselves and then love others because of God's love manifests to us. To be well-balanced, a contributor to your family, your friends, your society. This is a place where you nurture concern for others. You have empathy for one another. You, you serve others and manifest uh, even synergy with others working together. The third one, the mental, the mind aspect of our self-care um, means mental exercise. Reading, writing, visualizing, planning. It might mean that you need to cut out, and I'm speaking to myself here, uh, a TV program that doesn't promote a healthy God-honoring view of life or just too much time. Add literature, add writing, add crosswords. Karen is a good crossword. I, I envy that, because my brain, boy. Jigsaw puzzles, Sudoku. You, you all have your own uh, things that challenge your mind to um, keep it sharp. And then uh, spiritual, the soul. Self-care for the soul, uh, for the spirit means uh, dedicated pursuit of God through God's word and other means of grace that God gives us through worship. Hey, you're here this morning. You're, you're sharpening your saw. You're scripture reading. You're praying. You're f some fasting, some uh, discipleship, discipling one another. Self-care means getting in sync and harmony with God. But we are so busy. We're so busy, aren't we? That's where I bring you back to Martin Luther's quote. I have so much to do that I shall spend the first three hours in prayer. That is sharpening your saw so that you can be useful to God and his kingdom. Sharpening the saw means to take time to strengthen these four key areas of your life, your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Emotional, spiritual, mental, and physical. Keeping a sharp edge is necessary to keep doing other habits. These seven habits that we've been through these last number of weeks. Your ability and capacity to live the well-lived, God-honoring life in community with one another, loving God, loving yourself, loving others, is necessary in the practice of these seven habits. And I hope they are useful to you as you continue to live the God-honoring life that you desire. Yeah, let's pray. Thank you, glorious God. Thank you for all of the ways that you continue to draw us to yourself and, and, and strengthening your church, strengthening the individual members, calling us to that life of devotion and love for you that we might love ourselves, that we might love others that we might be useful for your kingdom, that we might glorify you and fulfill our purposes for existing. So thank you, Lord. Thank you for calling us here in this place today. Thank you for allowing your spirit to, to speak to each one of us, Lord. And, and Lord, as we just take a moment to be quiet, to listen to you and those, remembering those one thing that you want each one of us individually differently, but individually, to take away this morning.
Thank you, Jesus. Amen. And I'm going to invite you now to stand as we sing together, Take Time to Be Holy, number 395. You may be seated. This morning, uh, as we enter this time of praise and prayer, that, yeah, John. Well, here I've been sharpening my saw, so I have a promise to be more than if, if it's your joke, you're going to say it. Uh, let me. Oh, okay, this is good. Why do cattle make good sons and daughters? I don't know why. Because they always love their fodder. <laughs> a very good fodder's day. Uh, yeah, that's a sharp saw. I hope you didn't mess, miss any of the sermon when you were writing. That. No, it didn't. That was a good one. Any other praises or prayer requests? Chris. Let's raise our voices in praise and prayer to God. Good, good Father, we come thanking and praising you for your love, 
your ministry, your, your grace, your patience, your, your long-suffering over us, your wayward sons and daughters. Thank you for those who have returned and are giving their lives to you and service to you and your kingdom, being conformed to your image day by day. And we thank you for those who are yet to come to that place. We pray for our families. We pray for our, uh, those fathers, those children. We pray for one another. God, thank you for loving us the way you do. Lord, as you hear our, our groanings, our prayers, our praises this morning, we give you thanks as sovereign of the universe. And, in, and for those prayer requests that are so dear and near and dear to our hearts and yet unable to uh, speak them this morning, we pray that you would be attentive to the groanings of our heart, of our souls. God, I thank you for, for all those nuggets of wisdom that came through different parts of your body this morning, different members of your universal church, different members of this congregation who have gathered to, to praise and worship you. Thank you. I think that is so much the body functioning together that you desire. So we give you thanks. We pray too that prayer that Jesus taught his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I'm also just thinking about um, the video this morning, and you can access that as on the skitguys.com, I think it is, and, and all their other videos, because um, you might find them enjoyable, as we do. I invite you to stand now to receive God's blessing. <clears throat> May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you, he is faithful, and he will do it. Go now in that love, that joy, that peace of Christ to love God and serve his world. Amen. Go in peace, brothers and sisters.